So today we want to tell you a few things from our investigations in supply chain attacks. Why? Because we think supply chain attacks are very cool things. And it doesn't matter from, let's say, which side of the uh, barrier you're looking into this. Maybe, let's say, between you there's people who are working on supply chain attacks for fun, for profit. Uh, and maybe there's, of course, people who look into catching those things. Um, speaking from our side, uh, we are, let's say, specializing in catching the supply chain attacks as well as other sophisticated uh, attacks. Uh, we are members of the Global Research and Analysis Team at Kaspersky, also known as GREAT, uh, which led inevitably to a lot of jokes such as make great great again, or <laughs> great is not great anymore. Uh, I can assure you that we are still doing some things, not sure if they're great. Um, and these are some of the things that we have uh, written about in the uh, past years. To be honest, they don't fit on one screen anymore. So these are just some of the, uh, let's say, older researchers. Um, now, I think it's good when talking about supply chain attacks to remember some maybe of the um, uh, kind of the uh, old school days. How many people had one of these in their pockets like a couple of years ago? <laughs> Huh? Oh, yes, sorry about that. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. How about the researchers? And now they should be synced. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, technology. Right. So, how many people had one of these in their pockets? Because it was like really surprising. Nobody had one of these in their pockets. I was like wondering. That's strange. Uh, actually, my wife, um, she works for a, uh, an American company, and she had one of these as well. And she actually she had it until they replaced it with a software version of this thing that she runs on her laptop. And I was thinking, what's the point in having this as a software on the same laptop? So the idea is to have a kind of two-factor authentication, right? Um, but that was a, uh, an interesting um, story in 2011 uh, when RSA actually offered to replace these tokens. And that was a kind of, an, let's say, interesting uh, offer from the CEO of um, RSA. And I guess that one of the reasons for that can, let's say, be the fact that the RSA, they actually got hacked, I think it was in December of 2010, or maybe even earlier, when um, someone received, uh, someone in, uh, I think, HR received an email with an Excel file called uh, 2011 recruitment plans, and that actually happened to have a zero-day exploit, installed a backdoor, and, um, well, uh, that was very nicely described by um, RSA, so kudos for transparency. Um, but what was interesting is the fact that um, RSA probably was not the target of this attack. So around the same time, Lockheed Martin uh, also detected uh, an uh, intrusion in their network. And Stephen Adegbit spoke about uh, the kill chain back in the days when we were wondering, what, what is this kill chain thingy? And nowadays, I guess it's everybody kind of knows. But um, well, one of um, the things, let's say, that were inferred uh, was the fact that RSA was not really the target of this attack. But actually, uh, you know, Lockheed never confirmed that the intrusion was actually um, the result of the RSA breach, uh, according to Adegbite. But some people, um, you know, draw this conclusion that some of these breaches were actually uh, related one to each other. And the attackers actually tried to breach uh, RSA um, in order to obtain knowledge about the tokens. Not many people actually asked um, uh, how can, let's say, uh, breaching RSA can give them an advantage or give them the ability to um, hack into other companies? And why did the CEO of RSA offer to replace the tokens? That kind of suggests that the tokens were compromised, right? But that also suggests that RSA actually saved the keys from all those tokens in a database. So RSA actually hold was holding, they held the keys that were uh, written in all those tokens, which is, uh, I think, another interesting question. Uh, and why was that the case? Now, um, well, 
in the, um, there was an open letter from the um, RSA chairman, Art uh, Coviello, and he actually confirmed that information taken from the RSA has been um, used in an element of an attempted broader attack on Lockheed Martin. So let's say we kind of know that these two incidents were connected to each other. So we also, of course, uh, understand that Lockheed Martin as a military contract had pretty good security. So they were using all sorts of um, technologies into place, in look, including uh, two-factor authentication. So RSA was probably a key component in this whole equation into hacking uh, Lockheed Martin. RSA was an important point. Um, now, well, another interesting uh, breach which occurred the same t around the same time was a BIT-9 breach. How many people remember BIT-9? Um, I think they're now known as Carbon Black. Uh, and they had an incident um, pretty much around 2011 and um, the hackers which um, breached uh, bid nine, they got access to their code signing certificates and they signed malware with the bid nine certificates which allow them to bypass the bid nine solutions to target three customers. And bid nine never uh, acknowledged who were those three customers that were targeted with inf the information. But I, I think that overall, you know, um, it was um, kind of interesting to watch all these three things happening at the same time. The RSA breach, the B9 breach, the Lockheed Martin breach. And for sure, they were not the only ones. There were like several ones which took place around the same time that were not uh, uh, publicized in the same manner. Uh, it's also interesting to see why B9 was hacked. And this is uh, what they wrote on the blog that um, due to an operational oversight within BID9, we failed to install our own product on a handful of computers within our own network. We have a saying in Romania, which is the shoemaker doesn't have shoes. Um, and the reality is this happens, that people uh, you know, overlook systems, they don't install security solutions everywhere, even if those solutions could have stopped uh, a lot of breaches. And they do acknowledge that three customers, only three customers were affected by the uh, signed malware, the malware signed with the BIT-9 certificates. And I guess that um, if we um, fast forward a bit to 2017, we see some similar cases. Um, one of them, uh, known as a shadow pad uh, case, this was um, in 2017, we got a call from a financial institution who was not our client. However, they said they have some unusual traffic in their networks and they want to hire us to investigate because they can't pinpoint the source of that uh, unusual traffic. And we went uh, to this financial institution. Uh, we also looked at the system uh, that was making the traffic and that system was actually one used for uh, payments uh, in that bank. And um, there were basically, we couldn't identify any malware by looking at the uh, files on disk. So we dumped the memory, we dumped that system, and we started looking for the uh, unusual network traffic in the memory dump. And there we found there was a piece of software running on that machine from a company called NetSarang. Uh, and that was actually a legitimate software used for remote management. But inside this software, there was an interesting piece of code that would attempt to contact a bunch of uh, random domains. And in the beginning, we weren't entirely sure if this is a, let's say, desired behavior. Maybe, you know, it's a legitimate software which is expected to do these things. Uh, but when we compared it with older versions of the software, we discovered that that piece of code has been injected into this software from NetSarang. So we got in touch with uh, NetSarang and they did a uh, brilliant thing at uh, mitigating the attack. So what happened here was uh, another quite interesting case uh, when NetSarang was breached with the purpose of injecting this backdoor in this software that was actually um, used in a lot of uh, enterprises around the world. And that um, was, let's say, the entrance into all these different uh, companies for a very interesting uh, APT group that has been around for quite a long time, and I guess that in my opinion, they're probably the masters when it comes to uh, supply chain attacks. So if we look at the code uh, from this uh, malware that we recovered from the NetSarang uh, case, 
Uh, we discovered that was quite similar uh, with a plugin from an older WinNTI incident. WinNTI is another um, interesting APT group, and you'll see how it all falls uh, into this equation. Uh, and if you look at the code, it's pretty obvious uh, what it does. Uh, actually, no, it isn't. Uh, but if you look at the code this way, it's pretty obvious what it does, probably still not. So I think what it does, uh, it actually is a hashing uh, algorithm for the API calls. So they need to um, do this in order to run their shell code uh, in memory because they have no API imports in the code. Uh, and this code with the two unique constants you see there <clears throat> is very specific and this actually allows you to group them together and to see uh, what's behind it. Now, another, I guess, um, um, interesting information about this attack came from Microsoft. And Microsoft actually, they took a, an APT group known as Barium to court. So they sued them uh, and they said that the method of compromising stealing information involves the shadow pad malware. So, which the Barium def defendants uh, distributed via third, third party software provider compromised update. We know it's Net Sarang. So this is Microsoft saying that the APT group uh, known as Barium was behind this Net Sarang incident. Um, if we go a bit further, in uh, September 2017, Morphisec, an Israeli company, found uh, another quite interesting software, CCleaner, which is way more popular than uh, the Netsarang software. I think the Netsarang software was used mostly in uh, um, you know, big enterprises, but CCleaner, I think they have over 16 million users around the world. And one of the updates of CCleaner came with a very interesting piece of uh, code inside, which performed uh, uh, kind of a remote backdoor functionality. And if we, again, we'll look at the code, and this time uh, there's no C code to help, I think. But um, if you look at there, it's a custom Base64 encoding, and this is actually identical to the code used in a backdoor called Missile uh, from an APT group known as APT17, um, which um, falls into something that people have called the Axiom umbrella. And there's uh, a paper from Noveta, which I guess is the definitive paper on the Axiom group. But to be honest, the Axiom group is something which is so big that there's um, a lot of different uh, APT groups and operations which can fall under that. Uh, but nevertheless, um, the CCleaner attack is uh, again confirmed by Microsoft uh, at the Virus Bulletin Conference. Uh, John Lambert from Microsoft said that the Barium APT was also behind the CCleaner attack. So we have the Barium uh, APT group behind the CCleaner attack, we have it behind the uh, shadow pad attack that we discovered. So I guess that the kind of a picture starts to uh, you know, form. Uh, and we also looked at other samples that have the same Base64 code and some of them are of a malware called HiKit, uh, and others are of a malware known as ZoxPNG. And the, it's quite interesting that um, there's a very good presentation, by the way, what is Missile. Um, Chris McConkey from PwC uh, spoke about it at uh, uh, SAS conference two years ago. Um, and he spoke about Missile, which is actually the nickname of a developer that worked for APT17 and some of these uh, uh, Chinese speaking APT groups. And there's a lot of um, digital trails he left on the internet all these years that, you know, um, eventually can identify him by the name and so on. So I can recommend you to, to look at this clip. However, I think the most interesting part comes from the Noveta papers where they say that, you know, some of the malware used by Axiom, such as Poison Ivy, Ghost, that Shell, that's kind of generic. However, uh, tools um, only seen by Axiom are Zox PNG and Hikit. And Hikit or Hikit was one of the malwares that was used in the Beat 9 hack from 2011. So if you, you know, put all these things together, you know, a big picture starts to emerge and you realize that these guys have been around for a long time doing these supply chain attacks. So 
probably going back to 2009 and maybe even before. Um, so WINA and TI, Barium, um, LED is another, let's say, sister group of Barium by Microsoft name and Axiom. Um, how do they all, let's say, fit together? Well, um, Microsoft published a blog about these guys in 2017 and it split them into two activity groups known as Barium and LED. Uh, and they said they, um, let's say, one of the defining traits of these groups is their usage of the WinNTI malware. And that's interesting because we wrote about the WinNTI malware um, in 2013, 2012, although our research on the WinNTI malware began uh, around 2011. And um, when we started our research into this stuff, we found uh, a lot of uh, forum posts in Chinese from a number of uh, people. So one of them, uh, for instance, here it was a, a security researcher job, like pen testing, you know, kind of the usual technical requirements, nothing special there. La location is Guangdong or Guangzhou. And it was a very cool comment there. We said powerful background and no comments. Um, and if you're competent, you know, you can contact us at, at these um, addresses. And you see that as like a free meal, apartments, a, a villa of 200 meters, and even a single completed project will provide you with the money to, for your monthly expenses. And some people on the forum actually um, replied. Uh, one of the actors, uh, Merchancy, or uh, MER4EN7Y, he replied to this job offer. And Merchancy is actually one of the WinNTI actors that we identified. And he said, aren't you recruiting people for APT? Uh, Guangzhou is actually too far, but anyway, I support it. While other people on the forum, they said that powerful uh, background uh, actually means that it's supported uh, by the government. And it's kind of funny to see what happened to Merchancy. Um, a couple of years later, in June 2017, he was indicted for um, uh, hacking into Capstone Turbine. Um, and we have him, uh, let's say, quite uh, nicely identified as an uh, individual named uh, Gao Hong Kun, together with a few other perpetrators. Um, but putting together all these different points and the trails they left behind all these years, you realize that they've been doing these things for a very long time in a very, very uh, persistent manner, uh, compromising different companies as a means to get into other places. So obviously why this is happening, I guess that uh, one of the reasons is that we build pretty good defenses uh, everybody nowadays has antivirus, firewalls, sandboxing, next gen, whitelisting. And actually bypassing all these uh, different walls is getting harder and harder. Um, the truth is that the high end actors will always find a way to breach a target. They'll have a zero day for anything, right? And they will eventually breach that target. So to be honest, high end actors don't need this kind of supply chain attacks. However, medium tire actors, they, let's say, you know, this is kind of their bread and butter. So groups such as uh, uh, those under the bigger Axiom umbrella, Barium, APT10, this is, I think, one of their, let's say, top methodologies. And, uh, you know, the low tired actors will just have to move on to other targets. Now, um, why are they so hard to discover? Well, mainly because they abuse the existing trusts, such as code signing certificates uh, or trusted update mechanism. So we had the case with WannaCry a couple of years ago, which happened because they, uh, people didn't install patches. However, a few months later, we had the MeDoc incident in which, you know, the patches for MeDoc injected the malware into all the victim systems. Uh, and the problem is how to spot a tiny malicious code fragment, which can be a few kilobytes in size, within 20 megabytes of clean code, which is the proverbial needle in the haystack. So these are, I guess, the main reasons why they're so hard to discover. Um, another thing is that there's a lot of hypes and rumors about supply chain attacks. For instance, how many people heard about the Supermicro story? <laughs> okay, let's do let's do a, let's do a check. Actually, how many people believe that this story is true? Hmm, 
One guy. Okay, that's good. Or two guys. How many people believe it is untrue? Okay, a few more. And there's a lot of people who are probably not sure it's either way, right? Well, when, when uh, Supermicro actually published this story, they put a picture in that story. Uh, and that is, you know, you see there the um, main board of a high-end Supermicro server, and they circled a very small dot on the main board, which is uh, allegedly a small chip near the base, uh, near the uh, main board, um, the BMC, the baseboard management controller. And I know a lot of people who actually opened their Supermicro servers, one of them being myself, and started looking for that uh, rice grain uh, on the main board. And it wasn't until Kim Zetter posted on Twitter, like if you're hunting for malicious chips uh, based on the GIF from the story, um, it's just an illustration. So, <laughs> um, yeah, how many hours of time people wasted looking for that? So, I can confirm that at least I wasted a few hours uh, on that. <laughs> um, so let me ask Vitaly to tell a few words about um, some other cases of supply chain attacks. Vitaly. Thank you. Thank you, Kostin. Good morning, everyone. My name is Vitaly, and I'm, I came from Singapore, and I'm extremely excited to, to be in Canada. It's my first time here. And I spent the last five years in Singapore, where we have 33 degrees Celsius every day, 365 days a year. And um, I was extremely excited to see snow this morning outside. Um, yeah, um, and um, my, my slides, um, they are also a little bit spiced with this uh, technical ingredient. So if you see too many technical screenshots, just start yawning massively, okay? So I'll just you know, flip it quickly. Um, I wanted to start from uh, the best of the supply chain attacks. In my my point of view, um, I gave it an Oscar among supply chain attacks. Um, it's this one. That's the ATM card management software. Oh, sorry, you don't see it. Just a moment. Let me see. Okay, the ATM card management software uh, called Smart Card O in One uh, or X One that was um, available on a number of forums. Well, uh, you can quickly look into this, and, and uh, those security researchers realized that th this is apparently not, not the legitimate one. Um, in fact, that one was distributed through a number of, um, you know, um, crooks on the on the criminal forums, cyber criminal forums, and apparently that was not legit. So it was used; they promoted it as a tool to flash those cards that contain um, chip on the card that were reprogram reprogrammable. So they'd actually put some real banking uh, account information of uh, other stolen cards uh, onto those um, cards that you have, the white um, kind of blank cards. Um, and that was basically the, the database management software and also flashing software that required this um, USB um, appliance basically to, to do the, the flashing. So the fun part of this is um, that someone <laughs> decided to enhance this by adding a dependency to a zlib.dll. That's uh, generally known as compression library, but the legitimate one is called zlib1.dll. So that, that looks very much legit. And they just modified the executable by adding dependency of additional DLL file that, um, in fact, uh, resulted in loading of additional DLL into memory of uh, that process of the tool that was offered on the forum. And it was distributed on the forums. So what we found um, during this hunt after the Lazarus gang or Blue Norov gang that was uh, known for this notorious hack of the Bangladesh Central Bank in 2016, when they tried to steal 951 million US dollars from Central Bank of Bangladesh. So these guys also tried to kind of piggyback and, and hunt the other criminals to steal from their pockets. It's kind of a third party collection uh, from the criminals. You know, if you steal from criminals, nobody will ever trace you um, back to you. They'll probably find the original criminal uh, that was hacked, not, not the, the second layer, right? So that's what they did. And I call it the king of supply chain attacks because it actually targeted the criminals uh, by other criminals. Um, so if only all of them were the same. What about the real, um, banking software, uh, is it getting breached? So there is a story we found, and I wanted to give a warning that not all banks are the same. 
So I'm not talking about uh, big developed banks, but some of those that are uh, from the kind of the middle level, uh, they don't actually have enough of budgets for proper security and you know control of the software in their supply chain uh, vendors. Uh, this is why they got into troubles. Um, and we happened to discover these troubles. So uh, what we discovered was in the end, the, the recipe that the, the, the criminals used, so I wanted to show you this perfect pie, cyber criminal pie in nine steps, how to get into a bank or maybe a number of banks. First of all, you find an ATM manufacturer because every bank uses uh, you know, one way or another ATMs. And it has to be not too big, of course, it must be easier, easy to breach, right? So if it's a big one, they will probably invest a lot into defense. Not too small, it has to be international, so it's not based in your own country, right? Better to cover. The, main, the, the more countries, the better. Um, and then preferably offering white label ATMs. That means they are kind of non-branded or can be shared by multiple banks by just you know, gluing and sticking those logos on top. Um, that's a good thing because you can breach multi ba multiple banks if you compromise this vendor. Um, and then you go and breach the software distribution website where this software is available. Inject your tiny code into the software distributive. Wait, wait more. And then bingo, uh, you can please the dark side, right? Uh, you can do whatever you want because this software will be downloaded, the distributives of the ATM management software will be downloaded by the banks willingly. So it's kind of a uh, watering hole attack against banks. And this has really happened. So all these points are from the real case uh, that we discovered a couple of years ago. Uh, one of our customers in Australia actually showed signs of uh, some anomalous activities beaming out of their networks. So when we investigated how it happened, we narrowed it down to the distributives of the software that the administrator has willingly downloaded from the vendor website. And that one was still distributing the uh, Trojanized um, software for anyone in the world. Um, so uh, there is point nine, if you noticed. So <laughs> in ideal case, of course, you have to be caught by Kaspersky. Um, but um, that, that's how it looked, the distributive. And uh, all the bad guys needed to do is just to inject these few lines of the Visual Basic script into the MSI installation package. So, um, and that was one, uh, th that case was um, linked back to the US-based uh, vendor of ATMs who we notified shortly after the discovery and then they had to put it down and do the cleanup on their side. But uh, just a few lines of code, you know, that lead to execution of a PowerShell, downloading of additional components, and eventually breaching a number of banks that use this software. Uh, let's move on. And uh, kind of the, the main course of our presentation is the Shadow Hammer story that happened this year, uh, where uh, we, uh, me and Kostin, worked closely on this particular investigation. And in the beginning, I wanted to say that there was Reddit. <laughs> First of all, um, last year, uh, people on Reddit uh, that are quite security savvy um, noticed that there was a new update from um, ASUS or ASUS company from Taiwan. And they normally show like what is in the update. So they show this notification of a critical update, but there was nothing. So basically, there was an update that installed nothing. Uh, which looked a little bit strange to some of people. They, they started looking into like what exactly it is, what's the executable, and uh, some of them uh, noticed that uh, that's a little bit uh, strange one. Uh, some people uploaded it to, to VirusTotal to check for uh, potential malware inside, and of course that was, was clean because it had digital signature by ASUS, uh, ASUS Tech Computers. Uh, was a valid, verifiable signature by a trusted vendor, right? It was not detected by any AV, so people cooled down very quickly. Some of them found other explanation of uh, some uh, rock misspelling of the word force. Uh, someone speculated that just because ASUS is a known German company, apparently, and you know they do have these kind of mistakes. You can see this file name over there uh, spells force in, with a mistake. Um, but uh, the problem was apparently deeper. So um, people actually cooled down because uh, nobody detected, nobody found anything suspicious. There was no network activity from that executable, and uh, people let it go. Um, and also, somebody actually noticed that uh, the executable that was pushed was dated as uh, made in 2015. 
um, and they even uh, tried to uh, contact the technical support of ASUS and ask about that. And they tried to uh, also calm them down and um, suggesting to scan their computers for, for viruses if, if they um, are um, you know, feeling paranoid. Um, apparently, they did not discover um, anything for those people, but we made a cu curious discovery later. Um, it happened in the end of January this year, where we spotted some phishing updates uh, that um, contained apparently something, something uh, strange. It, they were coming from the official ASUS uh, uh, update server, and it was related to the live update utility of ASUS, um, and they had digital signature but at the same time, there was something in them that triggered our, um, our detections. So we recently started hunting for different techniques used by APT groups, and then we found a match in one of those digitally signed binaries. So initially, we thought that was a false positive. But when we looked closer, we found that, in fact, it contained injection. And it was in the same exact executable that was dated as 2015, but pushed last year to customers of ASUS. Uh, so it all looked fishy. Uh, we quickly made a report and, and got in touch with uh, ASUS to do our due diligence. We reported that there is some malicious injection. They definitely need to check all of the executables and take care of that. And we kept, kept supporting them um, since that, um, uh, answering all their questions, uh, technical questions. And we made uh, quite a few of discoveries on the way. So the Victorian techniques they used, they in fact took uh, old executable from ASUS from 2015 and then they patched it. Uh, they injected tiny malicious code and then replaced one of the resource files in, inside so they could transfer the execution flow from the original executable, the benign one, to the malicious and then download additional components uh, from the network. So in the middle of last year, they did understood that it's probably, you know, too visible, it was all in plain text, uh, so they added encryption, they added additional layer, um, and that's why they introduced the payload decryptor added to one of the executable code sections. But the principle remained the same. They just patched the same executable from 2015. They didn't even care about changing the timestamp. Um, so uh, these are some of the uh, um, screenshots how, how the early variants of Bagdoll looked like. Um, nothing special, but just allocation of the uh, memory and then running that uh, executable code in, in that um, block. What was interesting is this um, original PDB path or program uh, debug database. Oh, I see you started yawning. Okay, that's good. <laughs> I'll, I'll start doing this. So you can see that they created a project called ASUS Shellcode, which means they specifically program that payload for ASUS individually. So they did not reuse any of their tools. They made it specifically for this company, which is kind of cool. They definitely cared about not being detected. So in the new variants, they just changed the technique, um, how they inject the code. Uh, they replaced one of the common runtime functions, so it's standard functions added to executables while you compile it in Visual C. Uh, so it looks very much legit. So they just hijacked the address where the um, call is being made uh, to their own uh, shellcode um, loader, basically. Uh, so I'll go through this. Uh, another odd thing we found is that um, there are actually 230 of unique samples that we discovered, and we wonder like, why they're all different. And they all contain these strange tables of hexadecimal uh, numbers. And then we uh, analyzed like, what was those numbers. Uh, they were actually uh, quadruples of uh, uh, numbers uh, all together, they formed uh, the MD5 hash of the MAC address, your physical address of your network card, be it Wi-Fi card or the LAN network card. So they try to target people individually by their MAC addresses. Sometimes if you have two network cards installed, usually just LAN and Wi-Fi, they would verify both MAC addresses per victim. So they were very, very precise and they really cared about who will get hit by this. Although this update from ASUS was pushed to probably hundreds of thousands of users. They only were after a few hundreds of users. And um, it's still not very clear like who those were. Uh, we tried to find the targets. We even started an open campaign, like verify if you're in that list and so on. We released a free tool to check if you were targeted. But so far, we haven't seen any real hits. There were some false positives, some Huawei, 
uh, 3G modems, for example, <laughs> were in the list, but they all shared the same MAC address for some reason, so all devices had the same. Uh, those were false positives, but, uh, but no, no real victims came back to us. We could only see, we could only make this breakout by, by the vendors of the uh, manufacturers of the network cards. So apparently the leading one was uh, Asus Tech Computers itself, and then there was Intel and um, other Wave. Uh, technology. So it doesn't tell us much who exactly were they, those targets. Were they politicians? Were they scientists? Were they security researchers? We don't really know. Um, it's still a mystery now. But the story doesn't end here. Um, so there is a, actually an extension of this. Once we found Asus, we started hunting for, for more uh, using detection for the technique itself. And very quickly, within days, we found more. It all happened in, in beginning of February. It was boom, <laughs> because um, I live in Asia, and there is such thing as Chinese New Year. Um, it's pretty much like Christmas in, in the Western world. And you can imagine that um, role I had when I had to call ASUS and a number of other vendors and tell them just before Christmas that they are breached, the digital signature certificates are stolen and abused to distribute malware from their own websites. That's not type of news you probably want to report to, to the vendors. So I had some hard time and hard um, conversations um, uh, with, with those, but um, we managed to find more companies. Uh, so there were at least three different Asian gaming vendors that were compromised in a similar manner. Uh, the bad guys injected code into digitally signed executables. The certificates were all genuine. So the binaries were uh, validated, but they contained malicious injections. And later we uh, figured out what arsenal they used and we started you know, identifying those hosts on the internet and we found three additional businesses. Uh, for some reason they were all located in South Korea. Some of them were game vendors, some of them were pharmaceutical companies, some of them were big enterprise like um, conglomerate from South Korea doing pretty much everything. Um, they had those backdoors installed on their servers. But the beginning of the story, like all these malware became linked to one uh, actor, or at least uh, the, the group that is known as uh, Axiom um, Umbrella, so it's basically several groups perhaps, several actors, but kind of uh, linked to uh, each other. Um, initially, they were reported to us in the end of November. Uh, one of our partners came to me and said, look, I have this sample, I don't know what it is, can you tell me if it's malware or not? And I'm like a reverse engineer, said like, okay, a couple of hours, and, and you know, I'll do this. I spent a couple of hours, no. They, no. Few days more, I, I couldn't break that. I, like it, was, it was like um, a, a very sophisticated commercial grade um, uh, packer, the virtual machine based, which is usually you know, hard to unpack. But on top they had additional protectors. Um, I'm going to show you this um, in a few slides. But first of all, just linking these all cases together. And that's the rank story that uh, Kostin mentioned, the shadow pad uh, breaching this Korean a vendor of uh, server management software, NetSerVank. Uh, there was a sign uh, in this case of the gaming vendor that they also use NetSerVank internally. So it's just a coincidence, but it could be also a vector of uh, you know, how the attackers could get in. Then in Cyclina story where ShadowPod is also seems to be responsible, uh, it was published by Avast, uh, the company that now owns the Cyclina software, that ASUS was among the targets uh, that received second stage payload. That means they were breached, in other words. Uh, they were targeted and then they were breached. So it could also be a precursor of these attacks that we see this year. So it's stretching over many years. And also there is a link through the Korean Honkuk University. Uh, there is a command and control center uh, and that there were two different command and control centers, but they were all in the same sh small IP range, uh, slash 24 network. Um, and um, we don't think that this is just a coincidence. They just um, systematically abuse that particular network to host their proxies for the command and control centers. A uh, few words about the arsenal of tools. Uh, some of the cool things they do, uh, they use cheap tools to burn them first, uh, just in case it's picked up by uh, security products or administrators or security researchers. So they use a rudimentary backdoor that uh, is written probably by some students or, or juniors in their teams. Uh, so they push it first for initial reconnaissance, and this is where they collect MAC addresses. 
if you've been wondering like, where they got those MAC addresses of the targets, probably they collected it throughout a number of other campaigns uh, through such backdoor. Interestingly, this backdoor actually detected all versions of Fidel starting from Windows 95. I guess they're interested in that too. But that one was very minimalistic. So if they see that target is interesting, they would push something more complex, such as this. And this is what I've been working on since the end of November. That's the multi-layer, like first it was like VM protect, shielded code, and like multiple layers of decryption, decryption, decryption. At some stage I got stuck because it decrypted using the key I didn't have. It was the key that derived from the uh, one of the kind of system properties. It was a serial number of the, of the drive C that was used to produce the key to dynamically decrypt it in the next payload and execute that. So if you don't have the right serial number of your uh, C drive, it will just crash, which happened to me, which happened to the sandbox analysis and many other attempts to analyze it. So I had to brute force and find the right, uh, the right serial number in order to continue analysis. So it took me some time to make the tool to brute force um, effect effectively and then eventually discover like the whole set of the connectors and plugins they have. Um, and in the end, it didn't contain the real payload. It would go to the Google Drive and fetch the next stage uh, command and control server address. Uh, the interesting tool among those uh, used by this actor was server persistence. Um, this is what we managed to find on internet live servers, um, hosting that malware. Um, it's a very cool tool. They kind of uh, open and, and work on top of the port 80, which is a common port for the um, web servers, right? The HTTP protocol, the old one. Um, but they kind of add additional channel so they can host their executable in separate process, not as the um, traditional web script or the web application, but it runs as an executable and, and replies to certain uh, requests through, um, uh, through the Microsoft uh, HTTP API. So it's extremely hard for system administrators to track it, trace it back to the particular executable that uh, processes a specific HTTP request because there is no mechanism in Windows that, that can uh, help you do that. Um, so if you remember uh, the um, ASUS case, right, and it seemed big, uh, in fact, according to our data, we got only 57,000 of uh, our customers having one way or another those uh, Trojanized executables. And now, of course, not everybody uses Kaspersky, right? Um, and not everybody uses antivirus at all. So the real numbers are probably, you know, uh, much, much more, like times or maybe dozens times more than this. But if you look at the gaming industry, there's three vendors that we managed to discover uh, already were twice uh, as big as the ASOS case. So we're probably talking about many, many more users. And in that particular case, they targeted pretty much everyone. They collected information from every single system. In ASOS case, they were much more careful. A few hundreds were targeted, so there was no network connections, no network activity noticeable on those systems that were not targeted. So gaming, um, the users from the video gaming world, of course, don't care that much about suspicious uh, connections and their less security cautious. That's why they targeted everyone to uh, get as much information as possible. So uh, coming back to the uh, malware injection technique, I just wanted to highlight that in ASUS case, they did tiny injection into original executable, and in the gaming vendors, they did something very different. Uh, the malware was seamlessly integrated into executable. It looked like the developer put it there in the source code from the reverse engineering perspective. And this is where we were wondering, like, where those uh, vendors having some inside job or, or what like, but three companies at the same time, it didn't look like real. So it must have been something else. So we kept looking and we found that in fact, their development environment was breached. So this is like the next stage of uh, compromising supply chains where not particular software that was created is, is uh, Trojanized but the development tools are Trojanized so that everything you produce with these development tools will have a Trojan code inside. So it's like a you know, meta breach, I would say. And it is very, very hard to notice. Um, they just changed this uh, link.exe from the Microsoft uh, Visual Studio uh, toolset. Uh, again, they added DLL 
dependency, which did the job once it is loaded into the same address space of the, of the process. Pretty much like, uh, you know, this best ever supply chain hack by criminals hacking criminals. Very similar technique of injection. But um, to conclude, like, um, and this is uh, every point is number one, right? It's very important. When you compile lies to you, like it is really hard um, to find where the malware is. You will try to probably talk to your developers, try to figure out where it is coming from, where, where somebody injected that malicious source code. You'll do the review of the source code, but you will find nothing there. Still, the malware will be compiled in and it will look like you put it there on purpose as the developer of that software. It will, of course, go uh, below the radar because uh, once a developer compiles the code, you probably have secure channels to deliver to the code signing server and it will do the job. Um, and uh, most importantly, like, it, it will not be possible for the developer to easily find this because uh, let's say a developer creates a dummy project, like Hello World, right? It compiles and see if it contains malware or not. In this case, it will not contain malware. The, uh, the authors of this particular technique, um, they actually hard-coded the names of the projects that they want to backdoor. So if you try to compile something else, such as Hello World application or testing application, it will not contain any malicious injection. That was very smart. I mean, that delayed the discovery of the uh, backdoor component in... Um, uh, in the compiler. Yeah, and to conclude, I would like to uh, pass the microphone back to his question. Thank you. Right, I, I know we're out of time, but I think um, uh, um, after going through all these different examples that we have seen during the last 10 years or so, um, well, I guess that when it comes to discovering supply chain attacks, uh, existing technologies are not very good. And that's because existing technologies are not good at uh, catching trust abuse. Uh, and there's two main issues here. One, that's the code signing. So the moment that malware is, co you know, is code signed, that's kind of game over for most security solutions out there. The other issue is that even let's say that you disregard the certificates, you need to find the needle in the haystack. Uh, a tiny piece of malicious code within uh, tens of megabytes of uh, legitimate code. Um, so I guess, uh, how do you catch uh, future attacks? Um, if you look at what worked for all these cases, um, I guess that uh, code similarity is one of them. Uh, another one that is very effective was a network-based detection. Remember the financial institution who found the malicious traffic uh, from their organization before being able to catch anything else. And uh, I think it was uh, Rob Joyce, uh, who was the head of um, NSA's Tao, who once said that uh, one of the biggest nightmares for the NSA is a out-of-band uh, network tap and the diligent sysadmin checking the logs. Um, so it, when you apply this lesson and you look at the logs, these can find um, supply chain attacks. Doesn't matter if they're hardware or software, eventually those need to exfiltrate information or connect to their CNCs. Um, program flow analysis is one technique that we've been playing with, um, trying to see how a new version of a program differs from previous variants. The only issue is that some of these attacks, uh, you know, they're getting smarter and smarter. Um, and in the case, um, for instance, of the um, uh, ASUS incident, they wouldn't uh, reach out to the CNC unless one of those uh, MAC addresses uh, were found. So there would be like very little signs that there's something bad um, happening in that system. Um, but I guess we need to develop you know, more such systems, more techniques, and um, probably as uh, um, threat groups are getting more mature and these attack technologies are getting more sophisticated, we will also need to have technologies that can uh, find more supply chain attacks. So let's see what we'll bring to, um, in 2020. I guess I will see even more supply chain attacks. We haven't seen any significant, I guess, on the mobile side of things. There have been a couple of router attacks, but I think that's also quite interesting territory. So uh, I think it's a very, very interesting field and a very, very tricky th um, kind of uh, area of research. Uh, doesn't matter if you're on the you know, offensive side of things, defensive. Supply chain attacks for sure will 
be in the spotlight for the next years. Um, thank you very much.